On the Track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. Ken, what's in store for us today? Well, Barry, we are going to be committing rank idolatry by debasing ourselves in front of the altar of Alan Towers. I always think it is admirable when the On The Track team reach out to understand other cultures like they have done here. Well done to everyone involved. I really like the old credits. So what do we have in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, we've got a particularly exciting show for you today. We start off in Sumatra, where the CFZ 2022 expedition will be there by the time you see this show. And they'll be looking for the Orang Pendek and various other cryptids. But before they left, we had a long chat with them about what they hoped that they were going to be able to achieve. Then we go to Loch Ness, where our old friend Ian Squibbs takes us to the locations of several more classic Loch Ness monster photographs. And then finally, we go to Northern Ireland, where another old friend of mine, Ronan Coghlan, tells us about the legendary and quite fearsome Irish Master Otter. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's John Downs, and I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, and welcome to another episode of On the Track, a bi-weekly I think it's bi-weekly, isn't it? Yes, bi-weekly, twice a week show where on Saturdays we do about half an hour and we do about half that on Wednesday evenings. And it's a miscellany of hard science, weird shit and surreality. And if you don't know what surreality is, cop a load of this. An oily old egg with a red peg leg, thought a porcupine was his daughter. But he soon found out as he had the gout and would often wink under water. A red, red rose saw a big pig pose on the edge of a silver dollar. The end of his tail was a wide neck nail and in place of his face was a scholar. Before we get on with the main crux of today's show, I've got something very exciting to tell you all about. But... I'm not going to do the telling, I'm going to pass it over to the boys. Carl Marshall, Georgie Jackson and Richard Freeman, who are just about to embark on an exciting journey into the heart of darkness. So boys, by the time that people are watching this, you're going to be on your way to Sumatra. Tell us a bit about the expedition. Um, well, yeah, um, it'll be my sixth trip to Sumatra, which is a big island in Indonesia, if you don't know. Uh, <coughs> searching for the Orang Pendek, a upright walking ape uh, that lives on the forest floor that we believe is related to the orangutan. Um, when we were there uh, before, we got some hair that Lars Thomas from Copenhagen University took a look at and he said it was related to the orangutan but distinct from the orangutan and there was uh, it was from a new primate 
Well, you can't really get much better than that, except on the 2009 expedition, you did get better than that, didn't you? Yes, well, oh, pussycat. Uh, yeah, uh, Dave Archer, our, uh, uh, one of the guys that went with us, Dave Archer, uh, he actually saw the Oran Pendek with our, our late guide, Sahar Dimas. He saw it in a tree, um, and it was hugging the branch Sorry, hugging the trunk trunk of the tree with its face pressed up against it, as if it was trying to hide, as if it was it knew it was being observed. And then it climbed down out of the tree and walked away on two legs. And he described it as having a remarkably human-looking face, being very muscular, broad-shouldered, and having fur very like a uh, mountain gorilla, that dark, bushy fur. Cal, you put this expedition together. Tell me a bit about it. How did it come together? Uh, me and Jordy have been to Borneo before, and we decided quite a while ago that we'd like to go see Sumatra, just because it was close by. And um, I've always been interested in mystery hominids. Um, but not just mystery hominids, there's a couple of other cryptids there that are quite interesting, like the, the Chigao, which is supposed to be uh, a sort of large cat. Um, I'm also quite interested in a cryptid referred to as the Sumatran hummingbird, um, which is probably not a hummingbird at all. It would most likely be, well, if it was a bird, it would be a sunbird, but it's probably not even a bird. It's most likely going to be some sort of um, hummingbird hawk moth, possibly a new species. Georgie, what are you looking forward to most about the expedition? I think what the, all the technical equipment we have now, we have got the best chance ever of finding some evidence of Ron Pendek or Ron Cardell. Uh, we have trail cameras, we have uh, a 4K camera, and we have GoPros as well. So just speaking with the native tribes and the native villagers uh, and getting a picture of any evidence or sightings with them, and obviously the evidence hopefully will get something on the trail cameras. And um, we go to three different areas um, specifically and obviously hopefully come back with some credible evidence and hopefully see something out there. Have you got somebody on the ground? We have, there? yeah. We've got a, 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 a guy called Daddy who's organising the three areas we're going to, all the food and everything, transport. So he's going to look after us and he surveyed the areas already. Uh, so they're ideal for what we want to do. You should probably point out as well that the, um, the, the new areas are completely new. They are completely new and um, haven't been untouched so hopefully we could quite easily find a new species of something out there um, because they are remote as well so there's more chance with the less tourists and less people going there obviously there's, it's going to be full of wildlife flora and fauna so that would be great that will. Is Dally the guy that you used before, Richard? Yes, so uh, he sort of took over from Sahar when Sahar passed away. So we've, we've used Dally uh, a couple of times before. So what do you think the biggest challenge is going to be of the expedition? What's the thing that's going to be most difficult to deal with? Well, to me, it's always get in there, the journey there. Once you're there in the field, that's fine. <coughs> but the biggest challenge to me is all the hassle of going through airports and customs. And I think we've got 22 goddamn hours in Java. Heaven Jakarta, I think. It's Jakarta, is it? Yeah. And heaven yeah, knows what we're going to do for 22 hours. But I, I hate waiting around. Yeah. Well, hopefully there'll be something to do in Jakarta, maybe. A market to look at or mm. something. But, uh, yeah. What do you think, Carl? What's your biggest challenge you think you're going to be facing? Well, this time we're going for, mm, as far as I'm aware, previous CFZ expeditions to Sumatra have been one or two weeks long. And this time it's now a month. And I think in future there's no point going anywhere like that for less than a month. Um, so, being in, in the field for a long period of time um, can get tricky. Uh, yeah, I mean the heat is might be an issue, although we're going to be lowland so it will be a bit cooler and the time of year we're going it won't be as warm as August, July and August so that's something but obviously moving all the equipment as well and obviously water and power in the middle of the jungle 
is going to be quite tricky, but hopefully we've got enough porters uh, to six, help us get there. Six, six, six porters. porters to get us there. So, um, but that, that, that's for me. It's it's, it's the, the transport and getting to the place. Once we're there, we can set up camp and get settled and get get on with it all. Now I've got another thing that we can talk about. Oh I, God! I thought of this since this morning as I was staggering downstairs to take my medicine. And you're going to tell me that I pronounce it wrong, so I'm going to use the English, not the Irish word for it. The master otter. The master otter, yes. Oh, yes. that's not too bad. Do-a-hu. Do-a-hu, yes. Do-a-hu. The first the first bit actually can be pronounced Dorhu. That's the way they pronounce it in Cork. But um, whatever floats your boat, as it were. Um, yes, we can certainly talk about that. One of the things about the Dorhu and its uh, congeners, the master otter found in Scotland and I think in one or two English lakes as well, or so it is said. Um, I have never come on a very early reference to it. The earliest reference I have come on to the Dorhu was in the 17th century. I, there are pictures that date from earlier times uh, on manuscripts and on uh, uh, embroidery of a fearsome looking otter, but whether it's meant to be a Dorhu or not, I can't really say because they weren't in the Middle Ages too hot on things like perspective. But uh, the actual references to the Dorhu, I first of all looked it up in a dictionary which gives words of the Old and Middle Irish period. And it simply says Dorhu, an otter. And it is used that way to mean an ordinary otter in Irish today, sometimes. Uh, that means simply, literally, an, a water dog. Dur is an old Irish word for water. Ku means a dog or a hound. So I think that originally that was the meaning of it. And it later got applied to this larger beast, whatever it is. It's by no means impossible that the Eurasian otter species mutated and produced bigger members. Whether these bigger members constitute a new species or whether they are just individuals, lusi naturae, as it were, I don't know. But the accounts of them seem to specify things that are big enough to cause jaws to drop and people to take off at great speed in the opposite direction. I think on the whole, bearing in mind the testimony of eyewitnesses, particularly that character who made the painting of it based on his sighting on Omi Island, I think there, there must be something behind it. Now, whether it's a series of individual mutations that don't, in reproducing, produce further creatures of that size, or whether it is a new species that has evolved in various lakes, not just in Ireland, because you hear of it in other places as well, I don't know. A third possibility, though it's remote, is that the Eskimo, or to be more politically correct, the Inuit. Actually, I don't like using that term Inuit, and I'll tell you why. While all Inuit are Eskimos, not all Eskimos are Inuit. The term does not apply correctly to, for example, the Yupik of Alaska, who are definitely classified as Eskimos, but who scorn the term Inuit and say there are different people altogether. However, that's merely by the point, but they have a belief in a huge species of otter that splashes about in Arctic waters. Now, the thing about this huge species of otter is it's, it's not impossible to consider that in the ice ages, 
it came down and either bred in Ireland or left a few of its descendants scattered around there or left a few genes that would occasionally appear and mutate into larger otters. But it seems to be very definitely an otter of some kind. And uh, I think we have enough to go on to say with a fair amount of certainty that it does actually exist. Certainly traditions are widespread. What it is has to wait until one is dissected. And I, for one, would not recommend that you go and try to dis dissect a living duva who, as they are likely to voice very firm objections to such a procedure. What's the story about a lady in, I think it was the 18th century, who got killed by one? Yes, um, there is a tombstone in a graveyard in the west of Ireland, and I can't remember offhand the name of the town, but um, it has a very peculiar animal carved on it. The tomb belongs to Grace Keneally, um, and people always say, looking at it, that's a dua who. Now, it's certainly a strange looking carving. The story is that Grace went down to wash some clothing, uh, this being in the days before they had washing machines. And when she went down there, she didn't come back. Her husband grew alarmed. Grabbing his trusty knife, he went down to the shore. What did he discover? Well, he discovered Grace Keneally, or rather her insides, those bits of them that hadn't been eaten yet by the duva who, which was standing over her dead corpse, slavering in a macabre fashion. So he went charging down, and the duva who went back into the water, but he wounded it before it went. And then out of the water came the duva who's mate. The lake in, in question is Loch Grainy. It's quite easy to visit it. Um, and the man who had found it was thrown into confusion, as you might well be if faced by a large and ferocious animal. But his brother came along, and eventually they drove the second Louvre who off. They jumped on the brother's horse, which showed no hesitation in leaving the scene of the gore and blood with great speed, and was probably very much frightened by the Louvre who. Now, the question that arises here is, did the carving on the gravestone, Grace Keneally's gravestone, did it give rise to the legend, or did the legend lead to a sculptor's carving? We cannot say either with certainty, but certainly in the area, it was widely believed, and the local hedge schoolmaster, a hedge schoolmaster was a person who gave lessons to children because the uh, then British government had forbidden education to Catholics. Uh, the hedge schoolmaster actually wrote a ballad on the subject. And I think the ballad is printed somewhere on the CFZ USA website. If not, I can dig it out for you. But it is widely believed locally that in the case of which came first, the carving of the Duvahu, the Duvahu and his uh, girlfriend, or whatever you call them these days, partner, uh, it's widely believed they actually uh, existed and were responsible for the unhappy girl's death. And unhappy, I would call it, for I personally would not choose to be torn apart by a duva who, whether living or dead, I don't know whether he killed it first. And the tale has gone up. I found a variant of the tale in Donegal, much to the north. It's pretty much the same story, except there are none of the local things like the carved gravestone or the name of the woman who was killed. So I reckon it just traveled. 
There used to be in uh, 19th century Ireland and before traveling storytellers called Shanachis. And the story, a good story, often went in circulation. And this particular Shanachi probably told the story of Grace Connealy, but recast it in a Donegal setting. It's pretty wild up there in Donegal if you've ever seen the. Uh, breakers throwing themselves mercilessly against the rocks. It makes you think of the power of nature and of water, something we should bear in mind with uh, global warming at present. An awful lot of water up there still that's going to come down in tempest and flood. But to my way of thinking, uh, the Grace Keneally story is probably true, yes. Didn't you make a TV show a while back. I did indeed, yes. And right. it is now it is now being shown on the series Shiver, which is on YouTube. The people in Shiver who are in Canada put it up as an incident that happened in Northern Ireland. The monster otter of Northern Ireland is called or something like that. But in fact, the Grace Keneally incident, the story, and the whole uh, of the uh, the uh, YouTube video is set in the west of Ireland, uh, which is a lot wilder than the north of Ireland, except when the Catholics and Protestants start shooting at each other. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, Subscribe, follow our Facebook page, and check out our Patreon. And as the ghost of Joe Strummer, who is an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, wants me to remind you, always press the notification bell. Otherwise, you won't be told when there's a new show to watch. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of the show. And it's been a very strange couple of weeks. I'm recording this on Saturday the 10th, when we should have been watching the episode that went out about the Brontosaurus and about the second look at John Saiki's book about the Hong Kong tiger. But... For some reason, which I still don't understand, because we did check it over again, the show went out 24 hours early. And it also went out on the day, the first full day, of King Charles's reign. We had Richard and Carl and Geordie here for about 48 hours at the end of last week, and they were here filming massive amounts of footage for on the track over the next few weeks when we heard the news that Her Majesty the Queen had died. And that threw a spanner in the works, not just for the CFZ, but for the whole nation. You will probably have noticed that everything I've said each week about and this is coming next week has gone completely wrong. That's because I decided at the last minute I thought it was a very good opportunity to really examine in depth all the things that the boys are hoping to achieve when they're in Sumatra. So, all the plans of mice and men have all gone totally pear-shaped. I'm also dealing with the fact it's a full moon, which I don't turn to a werewolf, but I do go totally to the alley. But I'm trying to put it all together. This episode is now finished, and I would like to say a big thank you to... Louis, my producer, and to Graham, who looks after me, and to Miss Maxine, who puts up with me, bellyaching about life down the phone to her. And I'd like to say a big thanks to our guests this week, who have been Ronan Coughlin, Richard Freeman, Carl Marshall, and Geordie Jackson. 
we will be back on Wednesday. I've got absolutely no idea what's happening on Wednesday. Not because we haven't recorded it, but because I can't remember. And everything is so up in the air at the moment, it's probably likely to change. I believe that next Saturday's episode is the long-awaited one about sharks, which will also feature my old friend Tom Woodruff who's going to become a regular contributor to this show. But I'm not going to categorically say anything because, like I've already said, everything is up in the air at the moment. Not just for the CFZ, but for the whole country. But thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you've got something from it. And I hope you found it edifying entertaining, educational, but not enervating, because Bob Mann keeps on telling me I shouldn't use the word enervating because it doesn't mean what I thought it did. And I always listen to what Bob Mann says because he's a very wise fellow. So thank you for watching, and I'll be seeing you whenever I see you. Bingo! Bingo!